Lord, let's give God a hand this morning. Amen. You can be seated. God is faithful. Amen. We serve a big, amazing God. I love to sing about it. his grace, his mercy. Because it's because of his grace, because of his mercy, we're here today. Amen. Amen. Without it, we have nothing. We say that, but do you really believe that? We've got to believe that God is alive and well, and he knows exactly what he's doing. Even when we don't, his word prevails. This week, as I was doing some study time, I, uh, I was reading over in the book of Amos. And I read something, I guess, just kind of just stirred my spirit and just stirred me up a little bit. And so I just began to kind of research it and read it through and try to figure out what's going on during this time. But there was a time in the book of Amos where he's talking about famine. And he said, there's going to be a famine on the land. And he said, the famine that we're going to face is not famine of water or food, but of God's word. And I thought, wow, that's scary. That's a scary thought. You know, I told the story how I came back from Russia, and I remember just being so fired up, living overseas and doing a work over there and seeing thousands of people get saved and just things that God allowed us to walk through. And I made a real stupid statement as a young minister, and I said, you know, if I never feel your presence, God, I'll be okay with that. And I think for about 30 days, I felt like I was praying and it was hitting the ceiling, just kind of bouncing off. Wasn't going anywhere. I didn't feel any presence. I just kind of felt just like I was all alone, so to speak. And I remember crying out to God going, how stupid am I, God, for even saying such a thing as that? God, I need your presence. God, I need it every day of my life. I need your word every day of my life. And I remember the day of my breakthrough, so to speak. When I felt like we began to penetrate the heavens and begin to receive all things God had for us. And I was reminded of this, and I want to read this to you and just kind of bear with me. I want to go somewhere with it. But it speaks here in Amos 8.11. It says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I, will not, well, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread nor of thirst for water, but of hearing the word of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea and from north to east, and they shall run to and fro and seek in the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. As I read that and I began to research, there was a quiet time or solace time that theologians talk about between the Old Testament and the New Testament, and some give it about 400 years where there was kind of a quiet time between the two. And it was during that time when there was a man by the name of Alexander the Great, who was a young man in his 20s, when the priest came to him and the high priest read the book of Daniel, the prophet of Daniel to him, and he, as he read the prophet of Daniel, he got the word from Daniel, he began to think that a lot of those things that Daniel was speaking about was for him, and he began to operate in them, and he became very, very uh, uh, powerful. He, uh, he conquered all the things that he set out to conquer, all these things he set out to do. I mean, at an early age, he was in his 20s. You know, one thing I say for that is don't despise one's youth, Amen. Don't ever think just because he's 20 or 15 or 16 that God won't use him in a profound way. God will. Some of us old goats is the one that God's having a hard time getting off the couch. Amen? <laughs> but we find here, and, and, and over 400 years where Alexander the Great, he you know, had the word of God through the prophet Daniel, and he read it as the priest read it to him, and he, and he did all these great things. But then after that was taking place, and of course it was during a quiet time, and during the time when the word of God wasn't really uh, prophetically used, and he began to just kind of dry up, so to speak. They said in his 30s, like 33 years old, he died of alcohol poison. He drank himself to death. And I thought, wow, wouldn't that kill all of us if we didn't have the Word of God? Amen? Yeah. Because the Word of God is what shows us, directs us, guides us, leads us. You know. Now, we've jumped down and we realize that John is speaking, John the Beloved is speaking about the Word here. And he says in the Scripture, and I'm going to read some of this to you. He's talking about John... And he's talking about the eternal word. He says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him. And without him, nothing was made that was made. Without the word of God, there was a void there. 
There was a void that was taking place. Even the scripture in Genesis talks about everything had a void. You know, it was without form, without void. And he goes on to say, in him was life, and the life was the light of, the, of man, God's presence. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend him. Now, this is amazing because when you really study this thing out, and I'm not trying to get into a, a doctrine here this morning, but I want you to just hear my, my heart. When they talked about it, he said, let there be light, and there was light, correct? But it was days later before he created the sun and the moon. Yeah. Yeah. So what was the light? The light was his presence. Yeah. And so without the presence of God in our life, there is, there's total darkness, spiritually speaking. And so all of a sudden now we have John, John's coming alone, and we have to really realize here, some theologians talk about how Zechariah, which was John's father who was a priest, this was one of the first words that was really spoken from the quiet time. And the word was spoken that you're going to have a son, your wife Elizabeth is going to have a son, and his name is going to be John, and he's going to prepare the way for the Messiah. And so we pick up here, and it's talking about, he says, uh, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of what? Of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not the light, which we learned earlier when they asked him who he was, and he says, I'm not, the, I'm not the light, I'm not Christ. He knew his place, okay? He says, he was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of the light. See, we're sent to bear witness of the light of God. And the way we bear witness of the light of God is allowing the word of God to speak through us. Amen? He goes on to say, he says, that was the true light which gives light to every man come into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. And the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Now, at a time of this period here, you've got to remember, it was such a darkness there, and that when the, when the light began to shine and when the word began to be uh, uh, spoken, a lot of people didn't receive it. They, they didn't want to receive it. To this day, that's why they believe some of the people never received it through some generations. It goes on to say, and it says, to those who believe in his name, they, it says, who were born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Then he talks about the word becoming flesh here. And, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, when we speak about the word, there's power in the word. Amen. There's so much power in the profound word of the Lord. When we read the scriptures, we've got to remember, he's speaking to us through a prophet that's timeless for us today. And just the power of the word in our lives can change our lives. What do you mean by that, Pastor? Well, how many times have you been going through a situation where you're just down and out, and all of a sudden a sister or a brother or somebody spiritual comes to you and says, you know, sister, let me, let me share the word with you. And he gets to give you a word that God gave us thousands of years ago, and all of a sudden, man, that word just enlightens you. All of a sudden, that word just lifts you up. You know, many times the word, how many times, hopefully, you came to church and maybe you were feeling down and low and things are not going quite right and all of a sudden something is said and all of a sudden that word just gives you that extra boost that you need to get on through the day. Amen? It's the word of God that brings power in our life. Yes. It's the gospel that is preached through the word that just changes our life. Now, even one of the prophets, now, when you study out, you know, in, in theology and you study in seminary, they talk about the major prophets and the minor prophets. Now, uh, Amos was kind of what they call a minor prophet, but Isaiah was a, what we call a major prophet. And he speaks here in, in 5511, he says, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void. It shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the things for which I sent it. See, that's the word of God. When the word of God is spoken out, listen, it will accomplish everything that's set out to do. It will complete the task that is set before him. Now, we find later on, actually, where we see whenever Jesus came, and we call Jesus the word in, in John 10, 10, how he, when he came, he not only gave us life through the word, but gave it with an abundance. He said, he said the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. He's not come that you may have what? Life, and that it may have it with more abundance. See, God wants to fill our life with a supernatural abundance that we can carry out the vision whenever God in task for us to do. Amen. Now, last week, I spoke about the promise, and we talked about the promise of the Holy Spirit, and we read in the book of Acts how the Holy Spirit came. He told them to wait, and, and you know, obviously, Jesus spoke to over 500 people, because in, in Corinthians, it talks about he was seen by 500, and he told them, said, look, just go and wait, but only 120 of them waited. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I always say, what happened to the 380, you know, and, and that's just, to me, is a boggling thing that 380 of them missed the development of, of the power of the Holy Spirit falling on the day of Pentecost and missed the development of the church and missed all these things that God intended for them to do. Don't miss it. Yeah, come on. The Word of God says, don't miss it. Amen? Listen, receive what God has for us today. Embrace it. 
and realize that you are born for such a time as this. I don't care if you're in college. I don't care if you're in high school. I don't care where you work. Listen, the word of God will prevail on your job, and it will accomplish everything God has set it out to accomplish. If you allow it. If you allow it. Now, why is that so important? Because, see, the word, without the Holy Ghost, we can't understand the word. Can I say that again? Because, see, the Holy Spirit, when it came, it said it's going to enlighten us. It's going to give us understanding. It's going to give us direction. It's going to give us that understanding that we need. Now, whenever we think of the word Jesus Christ, many of us think Christ is just his last name. Christ is not his last name. The word Christ means the anointed one, which is the Holy Spirit. Without the anointing, we have no understanding, the Scripture speaks about And so without the anointing of the power of the Holy Spirit in our life, there is no understanding. The words just are just blank words. But see, how can we come to a service and I can sit here and preach about something and I can read my notes here and somebody in the middle gets something and somebody on this side gets something totally different, something this side. It's not because of anything I did. It's because of the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells inside the Word. And when the Word is being used, man, you might be going through something over here, this person over here, something totally different, and the power of the Word just goes, whoa. I get it. Whoa, that's for me. God, you, listen, out of a thousand people show up, God, you're speaking directly to me. That's the power of the word. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the power that the word prevails in, in our life today. We're living in the greatest time of, to live. The word of God is pronounced in such a profound way that just deep understanding is, is, is just common in such a deep revelation, a d- deep rhema, that things are just so wonderful because God is doing something amazing through his word. Yeah. We can sit back and say things like, that's not the way my mama used to do it. That's not the way Aunt Bobette or Uncle Clanton or whoever. That's not the way they did it. So what? God's word is rich and real for 2012. Quit living on yesterday's manner. Get the fresh word that God has for you today. 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 I don't want stale, maggot, growing worms word. I want fresh word. Now, when we talk about the word, during this time and this process, we find the development of the church. The church has taken place here, and something amazing happens at the day of Pentecost. And we find Peter, he preaches, and all these things take place. But let me pick up here in Acts 2.40, and it's talking about the growth of the church. And it says, and with many other words, and with many other words, this is Acts 2.40, he testified and exalted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. He's giving them a warning. Now, for some of us today, we need to, we need to upheed to this warning. Amen? Be saved from this perverse generation. Do you think this generation is perverse? Uh-huh. Uh huh. Listen, you just watch TV and you see it. Yeah. Amen. Watch the news. The guy on the news, this guy goes and kills his wife and kids and bunkers himself in a, in a, in a, a hole and, and then, then shoots himself. That's a perverse generation. Yeah. Because see, he's looking for some, he, he, he don't have the hope of Jesus Christ. Go. He's got some false yeah. misconception of all these things. And he keeps going here and it says, um, 41. It says, Then those who gladly received his word was baptized. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to the church. That's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. And they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in the prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now, this fear was a reverent fear, okay? It was a respectful fear, yeah. which we're going to talk about just in a minute. And he goes on to say, he says, Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. And sold the possessions and goods and divided them all among as anyone had need. Now, when somebody tells you that tithing is of the Old Testament, you stick your tongue at them and say, well, okay, well, let's take the tithe in the New Testament and give it all. <laughs> Come on, there you go. The tithe in the Old Testament was the 10%, which is a place, is a, a guideline. You, you give more than that, amen? But here we says, give it all. He says, so, so continually daily, one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God. Now, listen, this is what I want you to see here. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now, I believe with all my heart, God wants us to be favorable people. Yeah. Amen? I believe God wants us to find favor. We can find favor with God. We can walk in favor. We can find favor with people. Yeah. Because when we find favor with people, then you know what? They want what you got. There you go. 
If you find favor with people around you, they say, well, man, there's something going on in that guy's life. I want what he has. See, how can we sit back and say, oh, come to church? And then the next thing we say is, man, everything's falling apart. Life is horrible. My wife, my kids, my dog got run over by a train. My mama just got out of prison. You know all these things, amen? You need to play that thing backwards. And <laughs> Anyway, it's another story, amen? But how can we sit there and moan about all these things when we can say, you know what, I'm walking in the favor of the Lord. And see, the walk in the favor of the Lord is having an understanding of the word that God's trying to use for you to speak today. Listen, you don't have to have a degree in theology. You don't have to be saved for 400 years. Many times people say, well, I don't even know what to tell them. Let's tell them what God done for you. Amen. If you can tell them what God done for you, then guess what? That's going to change their life because it's going to come from the word that God is using through you to speak. Come on now. Come on now. Knowing the word, what the word says. Now, we find many places where we found favor. In Luke, Mary found favor. Yeah. It says, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Yeah. Now, she asked an important question. How could this be? I've never been with a man. Yeah. She could have easily said, well, you, you got me all wrong. But all of a sudden, she says, you know what? I found favor with God. You know what? If God chose me, then let it be so. Yes. Let it be so. Because many things changed during the favor she found with God. We find even Jesus increasing wisdom and stature in favor with God and man. You know, I grew up in a denomination. I don't mind telling you. I grew up in a denomination that used to say, if you find favor with man, you're doing something wrong. Come on. If people like you and they like you, you're probably not, you're probably not preaching right. You're not, probably not living right. I, I, I'll be honest. Some of you look at me like, that's crazy. I'm just telling you the, the type of stuff I grew up in. And I had to come a long way for me to stop back and say, you know what? I am highly favored of my father. Yes. And I am favored because God chose. You know why we're favored? Because we walk in the things God wants us to walk in. And we do the things God's called us to do. And when you do the things God's called you to do, you'll find favor with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Yes. Now, this morning, if you want to find favor with God, the first thing we need to find favor with God, this is the first thing. We talked about here, as, as I said, uh, the fear came upon every soul. Now, here's, here's how we find favor with God. We find favor with God when we begin to have the fear of the Lord. Yes. Now, yes. many people don't have the fear of the Lord. Do you know people don't have the, the students don't have the fear of teachers anymore? Now, when you say that thing, you, you think they want to be like, oh, I'm scared. No, there's a reverence. There's a respect. See, people don't respect God anymore. I mean, the way they talk about it on TV and the way they point to the sky and they say the horrible things that they say, they have no respect for the things of God. Right. You see, if you want favor in your life, you need to have a good dose of the fear of the Lord. Yeah. I tell people all the time when my kids were growing up, I didn't want them to have the fear of dad. I want them to have the fear of the Lord. Because when dad wasn't going to be there, guess what? If they didn't have the fear of the Lord, they would do whatever they want to do. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Oh, my kids. Listen, your fear only goes as far as you can reach. God can reach everywhere. Yeah. We need to have the respect and the fear. Listen, people don't have it anymore. You want to find favor with God, just begin to walk in the fear of the Lord. Even the scripture talks about the fear of the Lord begins, it brings wisdom. Even Psalms talks about, David was talking about, he says, this, Psalms 19.8, he says, The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlighten the eyes. Verse 9, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Growing in the fear of the Lord, respecting what God has to say about it. Now, you know, I don't, God's a loving God, and we want to talk about a, a loving God, and we love preaching about a loving God, and he is a loving God. And, you know, I say quite often, God's not mad at you. He loves you. He loves you. Listen, many times we think we've done so much that God can't love us. Listen, he knew you were going to do that before you did it. And he still died on the Calvary for you. He loves you. God loves you. But guess what? As, as we talk about God's love, we've got to go back, and we have to realize, listen, let me just say it like this. You know, God don't play. Come on. Like you ever said, homie don't play? God don't play. Listen, he can take you out. My wife used to tell the boys when they were little, boy, you do that, I'll take you out, make another one just like you. <laughs> God can take you out. Why? Because he's God. Now, I don't understand all those things, and I don't understand why things happen, but you know what? Don't, don't take God for play. Moses, who did all those great things, did something wrong. He, he hit a rock instead of spoke to the rock, and God said, you ain't going into the promised land. Now, can you imagine? I always thought, God, that's not fair. Yeah, I know. All the stuff he did for all those years, you're not going to let him do it? 
But see, God is God. I'm not God. You're not God. God's God. And when we learn to have the respect of the Father, guess what? We can have favor in our lives by respecting who he is and respecting it. All through the scripture, it talks about favor. Psalms 34, 9, it says, Oh, fear the, it says, fear the Lord, you saints. He says, there is no want to those who fear him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Then he says, come, you children, listen to me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. There's a teaching that takes place here, Amen. Proverbs 9, 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of the wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For by many your days will be multiplied, and your years life will be added to you. Why? Because, see, if you come to me and you say, Pastor, I, 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 I'm broke. I, my, my, I'm fixing to lose my house, and I'm fixing to lose my car, and I need $100,000. Can you bail me out? And I'll write you a check for $100,000, and you pay it off. Guess what? If you don't have wisdom, <laughs> and you don't have the fear of the Lord, next year you'll be asking somebody else for some money to bail you out. Get it? See, because see, wisdom, the fear of the Lord, there's so many things I could touch on this right here. I want to I move on. But we have to understand that reverence, fear of the Lord is a healthy thing. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Now, when we have the fear of the Lord, then, then the church, let's look here at Acts, Acts 9, 31. It says, when we walk in the fear of the Lord, it says, then the churches throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samara had peace and were edified. Why were they edified? And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. Now, I said before, the church is like a, a, a living organism. Amen? We've got to understand that, you know, it, the church is alive. The body of Christ is alive. And the only thing that stops, and listen, when's the last time you woke up your kids in the morning and said, look, kids, I want you to get up today. By the way, I want you to grow. <laughs> they grow because that's who they are. They're alive. The only reason they will not grow is if you don't feed them. Or they're sick. If they're sick and not fed, then they don't grow. I, I, we spend time in Russia, and one of the saddest things we had to deal with is the orphanage there in Russia. There were some kids that were dropped off at the orphanage when they were just babies, and because of the, the mask of the orphans and stuff in that area, some of those kids don't even get touched for years and years and years and years. And it will, it will literally blow your mind. You go in the orphanage, and you see these kids, in these in, they're like little cages almost. They got them in these big baby bed, so to speak, and they got them like these, we call them cages, and they put them in there, and, and they just leave them alone. Yeah. If you leave a kid alone and you don't touch them, you know they don't grow? Right. It's so amazing. You look and you think, man, this, this little kid must be 18 months old. They're like five. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you've never seen anything like that, it will blow your mind. It's sad. It, it breaks your heart. But see, the same thing is as we begin to understand the, the body of Christ, when we find favor with the things of God and we find favor with the people, the body of Christ is, is, is healthy, it will begin to multiply and begin to grow. And we need to understand that. Now, one of the things is we find favor when we have the fear of the Lord. This is what happens. When we have favor, we begin to be fruitful and multiply. Now, what does he say in, in Genesis? He speaks over in Genesis 127. It says, so God created man in his own image, and image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, listen, don't add, don't just keep subtracting. That's what he says. No, he says, be fruitful and multiply. It says, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, if your God gave you those things, and you're not, you're not utilizing those things, then sad for us. Amen. But when we find favor of the Lord and we're doing the things God, listen, you will, be, you will begin to multiply, amen, spiritually speaking. Now, somebody told me, well, you know, it's not about numbers. Yes, it is about numbers. Because the more people we have, the more people that we can touch for the kingdom of God. When somebody says, well, I just want a little few people, you know what they're saying? They're, they're selfish. They're selfish. I want, I want God to touch this whole community. Listen, I, I don't pray just for Christian Living Fellowship. I pray for the Assembly of God Church. I pray for Cooper Baptist Church. I pray for East Leesville Baptist Church. I pray for all the churches I know of preaching the gospel in this community. Because it's not about one church. It's about the kingdom of God. And when we understand God wants to multiply the kingdom of God, then we get all these things away from us and say, God, I want to do what you called me to do, and I just want to say what you want me to say and allow me to be who you want me to be. Understanding, being fruitful and multiply. Now, my son is good at fruitful and multiply. He got five kids, amen? <laughs> Shona, y'all doing, doing a good job, amen? Keep up the good work. Now, here's the next thing. 
We find favor when we stop asking the mist. Now, what, what do you mean by that, Pastor? Let me read this to you. James 4.1. Where do wars and fights come from among you? It's asked a question. Do they come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and, and um, covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. Verse 3. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spin it on your own pleasures. And he's, and he's calling some things here. Now, one of the things that you think about ask amiss, in other words... You don't find favor with God because you're not asking for the things God wants. You ask it for the things your selfishness wants. Yeah. Yeah. You're asking this. Yeah. Just being self-centered. Yeah. You know, God is looking for to multiplication by saying, you know, God, I, I, I want what you want. Not what I want. <laughs> you know, we, you know, let me break this down. I, I said this morning, you can pray for a big shiny Cadillac. And you can say, I want a big, shiny Cadillac because I want everybody in the neighborhood to know that I got a big, shiny car and I'm, doing, I'm successful. That's the wrong reason. Yeah. Now, you say, God, give me a big, shiny Cadillac because I can put more kids in them to bring in the church. That's the right reason. You follow that? And so many times we ask for the wrong reasons. We ask for selfish gain. Listen, I want the church to multiply, not because of Bobby Ganaway. I want the church to multiply because I want to see souls saved. The Bible said a man who wins souls is wise. I want to be wise. Yeah. I want to win every soul that God gives me an opportunity that passes this way. Will you? No. I wish I could. Can you stop the back door from bleeding? No, you can't. It's going to constantly be a revolving door. But guess what? Every time we have an opportunity, we're going to pour into people's life, and we're going to see people's life change. This week, I got a phone call, and, 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 and we went and met a, a, a man and his wife and kids for lunch, and it was a guy that, that Julie and I was able to, to reach when he was here 14 years ago. And now he's, he's serving in the church he's at now in another state, moved in the military. Why do you say that? Because you know what? That's, that's the multiplication I'm talking about. That's the things that we pray for, and that's the things we see people's life change when you see go to other places and do the things God's called them to do. Here's the next thing today. Favor comes to those who walk in victory, not like a victim. Come on. Say it. You see, read this. Let me just read it, then we'll go some. 1 Corinthians 15, 55. O death, where is your sting? O hell, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brother, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that the labor is not in vain in the Lord. Now, many times things happen, and we want to be the victim. We want to say, oh, poor pitiful me. <laughs> they always pick it on me. <laughs> you need to say, you know, greater is he that's inside of me than he's in the world. The victory I have is in Jesus Christ, not in myself. It's like I talk about righteousness. You know, people, what is this word righteousness? Righteousness simply means being right standing with God. When you walk in the righteousness of God, it's not yours, it's his. You know, my righteousness is filthy rags. But I'm not in my righteousness anymore. I'm in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I'm not in my battle. I'm, in, I'm victorious because of Jesus Christ. You see, I could sit around all day long and say, oh, poor pitiful me, and, and, and not get anywhere with things of God. You know, as I said before, how can you win somebody to the Lord when you're like, you know, come to church, but poor pitiful me, I don't have enough money to get gas or, my, or feed my kids or whatever the case may be. Yeah. You know, Listen, we need to get to a place where we say God is good, God understands, and God's going to take care of us. We need to understand the victory that we have is not in ourselves. It's in God himself. Being victorious in the things of God. Even John speaks about it in, in 1 John 5, 4. It says, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. That's what it says, our faith. It says, who is he who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? You see... Our faith, when we begin to believe that he is the son of God, then we begin to believe that he can do all things. There's nothing impossible for him to do. Now, some of us put ourselves in situations where we think it's impossible to get out of. Guess what? He knew you were going to be in that situation before you got in there. And he gave Jesus. That's right. He always gives us a way of escape. No matter what we fall into, he's going, hey, look, psst, over here. Got your way out. When we figure that out, we realize that we can be victorious in the things of God. God wants us to find favor as we walk in his victory. Listen. God, I'm going to say I'm going to get in trouble with this one. 
There are people in ministry today, missionary ministry, different ministries, that they, pr- they, they prey on, on playing the victim to get financial gain. It's spiritual manipulation is what it is. Poor pitiful me. I'm over here. Poor pitiful me. Give to me. Poor pitiful me. Listen. If I go to lunch with somebody and I invite them to lunch and they could be very wealthy, I'm going to grab the check. I'm going to grab the check. Somebody say, well, he's got more money than you do. So what? You know what? I, I don't want him to ever think that I just want to go to lunch with him because I know he's got money. See, we need to come in a place that, you know, we're victorious. God, God knows what you stand in need of. When we're obedient to things, God, he said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken or seed begging for bread. When you walk in the obedience of God, listen, I'll tell you what, let me just jump to the next one. How about that? <laughs> Favor comes to those who are open to God's will, not our wants. Yeah. Open to God's will, not our wants. Yeah. I told people we sound like an old car with a dead battery. Won't, 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 won't. Instead of saying, God, God, I want your will to be done. Even Jesus said it. God, you know, I know you can send 10,000 angels, but God, I want your will to be done. Nevertheless, Nevertheless, God, we want your will to be done in our lives. God, I want want your will. Listen, don't. We do things over here and call God to come over here and do what, bless what I'm doing and saying, God, I want to go where you're blessing. I want to do what what you want me to do. Going back to being the, the victim, you know, many times we say, Oh, Pastor, would you pray for me? I feel like God is really wanting to use me. And I'm like, okay, brother, come over here. And I say, you know, God, I pray you just use my brother and sister today and just, you know, let him do things. Just use them in a mighty way. And next week they come back, Pastor, pray for us. They're using us. Well, what did you pray for? I'm just being used. Listen, we all being used for the kingdom of God. Get over it. Listen. Can I tell you something? I, and I know this is going to sound real. I want to be used. Watch out, man. We'll be careful. <laughs> <laughs> My wife wants to be used. <laughs> I want to be victorious. I want to say, God, here I am. Now, let me tell you something. Being used is not easy. It comes with a price. It comes with a price. But you say it, which is what you're saying, not my will be done. God, your will be done. Let your will be done. You see, you find favor when you say, God, I want your will more than anything else. See, the things that I pray for, I tell you two things that I pray for all the time. I pray for God's will and I pray for God's wisdom. God, I want your wisdom. God, I need wisdom. I need your wisdom. God, let, let, let me do your many times. Let me tell you something. I, I've learned this. There's many times that we get caught up and, you know, we think, well, we're going to do something. We start on something. And, and listen, I'll tell you real quick. If I figure out real quick I made a move that, that it's not God's will, I'm the first one to shoot it. I'll shoot that sucker. I don't, I don't keep riding a dead horse. You know, some people just get so prideful and like, well, I said God wanted us to do that, so we're going to keep doing it. Next thing you know, they just run themselves in the ground. If I ever get to a place where I feel like God wants me to do something, I'm going to do it. And all of a sudden, God begins to show me you, you took the wrong turn. I'm getting off the boat. Why? Because I want God's will to be done. Will you make mistakes? Yes. 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 Listen, we have to understand that, that we are still human. Well, that person, you know, they were, they were in the flesh before they ever got in the spirit. Oh, yes. That's where it starts. How can you get in the spirit without being in the flesh? You know? I mean... You know, whenever you say God moves, it's not that you see some big cloud going, woo. You when you say God moves, it's because people move. God uses people. When we're obedient to the things of God, God will use us. And guess what? We're flawed. And if you're flawed, expect to make mistakes. All of us make mistakes all the time. I had a girl one time I was in college, and she said, God told me to marry my husband, and he was lost. And so we were in class, and of course it became a big debate. You're in theology, and it became a big debate because God said, "Don't be unequally yoked," and you know all the scriptures talks about those things. And 
And so they were arguing back and forth, going back and forth. You know, God didn't tell you that. And, da, 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 da. and she was crying, and she was arguing, and God told me to marry my husband, and now we're in Bible school. But, you know, seven years, you know, he was hellacious, and he was lost, and finally got saved, and now we're in Bible And this big debate going on. And I never forget the professor was so smart. He said, he said, let me, let me end this argument for y'all. And he looked at the girl, and he says, you know, I won't, I won't debate that God didn't speak to you. I won't debate the fact that God didn't speak to you. I will debate your timing. Now, think about that for a moment. So her timing was off. Maybe God did tell her to marry this guy, but God would have never allowed you to marry someone that's not saved. Don't missionary date. Listen, I'm talking to teenagers right now. Don't missionary date. Don't go out and say, look, I'm going to win this person to the Lord. Listen, they're going to take you down. That's right. If they don't love Jesus, they ain't going to know how to love you. Missionary date. That's what a lot of people do. I'm going I'm to go out with that good-looking boy at school because I'm going to win him to the Lord. Next thing you know, that good-looking boy got a little Susie in the back seat. Right, listen, I'm, I'm no play. I, I'm real here. We need, to, we need to wake up and realize that little John and little Susie, you know, they got hormones. Come on, somebody. I don't, just because they walk in the chores, they don't leave their home. Walk in the church, I mean, they leave their hormones at the door. One of the things I watch here, man, I watch some of those guys come, our pretty girls around here, and some of those guys come in and they just want to try to, to get to the girl. Brother, I'll spot them in a heartbeat. I got a gun. <laughs> a big gun. <laughs> we got plenty of room. We got a few buried in the bag. We'll bury some more, amen. <laughs> if this was on tape, I'm just kidding. Do not finish right there. God wants us to, to protect our children. And see, when you're walking in the favor of God, those things will take place. Our prayer is, God, I want, I want your favor. Because, God, when I find your favor, people see it, and they'll just flock to favor. I want people to flock to the favor of God, not because of me, because of you, God, what you've done for me, what you've done through me. I see people's countenance change all the time. I see people. I, there was a girl that we won in Russia. I'll never forget this. She was, lack of a better way of saying, she was a streetwalker. And she came to church in some real miniskirt leather, rough-looking just really rough looking. And right before we left there, she got saved. Right before she left, she got saved. I mean, like the week before we got left, she got saved. And we left, and we were gone for about a year. And, and the, the person we turned over the work to, and he kept telling us about their new worship leader, the new worship leader in the church, new worship. And I couldn't figure out who they, she was, he was talking about, the new worship leader in the church, new worship leader in the church. And so we went back. I guess it was a year later, a year and a half later, two years later, whatever it was. Went back to check on the work, and he said, look, we're going to have worship tonight. So we all went to worship, and I'll never forget, Judy and I walked in the door, and the worship was going on, and we looked up, and we saw this girl that had got radically saved in our ministry. She did not even look the same. Her whole countenance changed. She had such a purity about her. I mean, just worship just come flowing through her. We, Judy and I, sat, and we wept like babies. God can change things. It's the favor of God that draws people to him. Listen, we need to find favor. Here's the last thing this morning. I want to end this right here. and Just bear with me as I read through, through this. Favor comes to us when we are reminded of God's word for us today. When we're reminded of the word that God has for us today. I want to pick up in Matthew 24. Verse 32. It says, Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When his branch was already begin, become tender and, and put forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it's near at the door. Or surely I say to you, this generation will no means pass away till all these things take place. And then it says this, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. God's words will no means pass away. We keep reading here. He says, But of the day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and getting married until the day that Noah entered the ark. 
and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. It says, then two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding in the meal. One taken, the other left. Verse 42, watchful, watch therefore, for you don't know the hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief was come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. Who then is faithful and wise servant, whom his master makes ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is the servant whose master, when he comes, will find so doing. Surely I say to you that he will make the ruler over his goods. But of the evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink. And with the drunkards, the master of the servants will come on a day when he is not looking for him in an hour that he's not aware of. And he will cut him into two apart. And he will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. And it says, they shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, that's the word of the Lord. And that's the things we have to be reminded of. I went, was it last year, Doc, that y'all allowed us to, the condominium in Branson? Was it last year we went? We went to to, uh, Branson, and we went seeing the ark, Noah's ark. It was a play. It, it's it's amazing play. It's phenomenal. I could describe it to you, but it, it's just an amazing play to see. If you ever seen it before, it's just it's amazing. But one of the things that I really saw was when Noah was preaching to the people. He was preaching to loved ones. He was preaching to friends, neighbors. Of course, none of them received. The only ones that came into the ark was his family. We know the story. And the Bible says. That God shut the door. Because see, if Noah would have shut the door, Noah would have probably opened the door. But see, God shut the door. And when God shut the door, I can imagine that gopher wood was not soundproof. I can imagine that as they begin to, the waters begin to rise, as he told them it would, the rain's falling, all these things taking place. I can imagine the screams that Noah and his family had to endure because people were probably beating on the boat, beating on the doors, let me in, I'm sorry, I repent, I repent, I repent. Let me in, let me in. And he can hear probably his neighbor saying, hey, it's me. You borrowed sugar from me. You came to my house for supper. It's me, please open the door, open up, please open up. And Noah and his family couldn't open the door because God shut the door. The scripture says, so it was with Noah is that we'll be with the Son of Man coming. And I could just imagine, we know that Jesus died on Calvary for each and every one of us for the remission of our sins. He died a, a sacrifice so we could have life with an abundance. He died so we could have salvation. He died for you and I. And just for a moment, just imagine the same thing you thought about knowing the door as the arms of Christ swing wide open. And he's saying, come in, little children. Come unto me who lay. Come unto me. I'm, your yoke is my birth. Come unto me, all these things. Come unto me. Come, receive from me. Come unto me. And the door of his arms are wide open. But see, the truth is, we need to be reminded of this, that those doors, his arms, one day is going to close. And when it does, I don't care how much money you got, I don't care how connected you are. Nothing you can do is going to be able to pry those doors open again and say, wait, 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 wait. I'm sorry. I I missed it. It's going to be too late. It's going to be too late. See, this morning, that's the things that we have to be reminded of. Because maybe you're here today and you're saying, oh, Lord, thank you that I have salvation, that I won't have to face that. But think about your neighbors who will. Think about the people you work with who does. Think about the ones that, that will have to face it. And think about what you could have done to gave the truth to their life. Walking in the favor of the Lord brings people, honestly. 
one day that door is going to close. And for some, he's going to say, well done, my faithful servants. And some, he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you, works of iniquity. The day's coming. The day is coming. Every head bow, eyes closed. Just give me a moment. We're fixing to dismiss, but don't leave. Just hang on for a second. Just heads bows, eyes closed. Caleb, won't you come to the stage? I'm going to ask a couple of questions this morning with every head bow and eyes closed. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to point you out. None of these things. The first thing is I'm going to ask those who are here today that says, Pastor, I know Jesus as my Lord, my Savior. And I probably am not walking in the true favor of the Lord so other people can see the things God wants through me. I want to walk in the favor of the Lord. I want to do... So whenever I begin to walk in the favor of the Lord, multiplication takes place. All these things take place. I want the favor of the Lord in my life. If that's you this morning, right where you're at, no one looking around, not going to embarrass you, not going to call you out, just want to pray for you. If that's you this morning, just raise your hand. I want to pray for you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Anybody else? Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else? Thank you, Father. Anybody else? I'll pray for you. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else? Thank you, Father. God, you see the hands of your people. And God, we want to walk in your favor. And God, by walking in your favor and doing the things you call us to do, God, we realize that we can win many souls to the kingdom of God. So God, allow us to have that favor in our life. Allow us to walk in your favor. Allow us to, to begin to be multiply, multiply in our lives. God, forgive us where we fail you for not walking in your favor. The next question is I want to ask this. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor, I never received Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. Or maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor, there was a time in my life I was serving the Lord. But I realized if I died right now, man, I don't know if I'd go to heaven. Well, I want to pray with you. I want you to simply pray this prayer. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Jesus, come into my life and live in my life today. Jesus... From this day forward, I'm going to serve you with all my heart and all my life. Jesus, you're mine and I am yours. See, maybe you prayed that prayer this morning. Maybe for the first time or maybe a prayer of rededication. Again, it doesn't matter to me, but I want to pray for you. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to embarrass you. just want to pray for you. If you prayed that prayer this morning, either for the first time or prayer of rededication, just raise your hand and put it back down. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody else? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. God, you see the hands of your people, and you know their hearts. And God, I pray on this day that you begin to minister them in such a supernatural way. Whatever they stand in need of, God, you will provide. God, I thank you for saving souls. I thank you for lives that have been rededicated to the kingdom of God. And God, we honor you on this day, and we thank you that we can find favor with you. And thank you, Father, for allowing us to be here today to receive your word. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you receive that word, let's give God a hand this morning. Amen.